Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Interview episode on the Cavalry of the Seleucid Empire with Dr. Sylvain and Girard. Hello, everyone. Joining us on the show today is Dr. Sylvain and Girard, a recent PhD graduate from the University of Manchester. Dr. Girard is a historian of the Hellenistic period. The bulk of her research is focused on warfare during the Hellenistic Age, specifically the cavalry traditions of the Seleucid Empire. She has written a number of articles on the role of animals in Hellenistic warfare for sites like Bad Ancient, and has appeared on other history shows and podcasts, but today she is here to share her work and discuss the Seleucids. First off, I'd just like to say welcome and thank you very much for coming on to the show. Thank you for inviting me, it's a pleasure to be here. Would you mind giving the audience a bit of your educational background and how you got involved into the Hellenistic period and the study of cavalry? Sure. So I'm currently an honorary research fellow at the University of Manchester, where, as you mentioned, I recently completed my PhD in classics and ancient history. It's also where I did my master's and undergraduate degrees. So my PhD research focused on the cavalry of the Seleucid Empire, as well as its unconventional mounted troops. So by which I mean the war elephants, the scythe chariots, the camel archers, the things like that. And my research was concerned with exploring the development of the mounted arm in this period, and how these different elements were integrated into the theoretical and tactical conceptions of the army as a whole. So this research stemmed from my master's dissertation on Hellenistic war elephants, and I was first interested in the Hellenistic period because this is a time of great cultural interaction and development. You know, so you have Alexander's Greek Macedonians alongside the different indigenous peoples and cultures of the ancient Near East. And I'm particularly interested in how the introduction and use of these more unusual and unconventional units and like why they were introduced, how they were used and, you know, the way in which they affected the development of warfare. So you see a lot of variety in these unusual units being used in the mounted contingents of Hellenistic armies. And this is especially so in the vast Seleucid Empire, you know. It encompasses so many different peoples and traditions. Its borders, you know, at its height are stretching from Asia Minor in the west, so like modern day Turkey, Syria, all the way through to Bactria and ancient India in the east. So it's a really rich area for looking at these different types of units and the development of this type of warfare, you know, and these cultural interactions. Given the relative paucity of information on the Seleucid Empire, what sort of sources can we draw upon to get a better picture of their army? Accounts from ancient authors, monuments, archaeological remains? Yes, so this is the eternal lament of the Hellenistic historian. I mean, it's a common lament of most ancient historians that there's not a lot of sources, but it's especially true of the Hellenistic period, where, you know, unless you're studying the Ptolemaic Empire where there's lots of papyri, you tend to find sometimes the sources are a little thin on the ground. So for the Seleucid army in particular, we're hindered by the fact that on only three occasions do our literary sources actually provide us with a detailed overview of the individual contingents within the Seleucid army. So this is Polybius's account of the Battle of Raphia for 217 BC, Appian and Livy's accounts of the Battle of Magnesia in 190 BC, and Polybius's fragmentary account of the military procession at Daphne in about 165 BC. I mean, of course, we do have a range of evidence for, you know, lots of different Seleucid battles from Ipsus to Elassa in 160, and, you know, even beyond that, though, it gets a little more sporadic after that. But it's only these three instances, Raphia, Magnesia, Daphne, which we give us the details of the individual units that are present. So this evidence only covers a 52 year window, you know, from 217 to 165. And we know that the Seleucid Empire existed for like nearly 250 years. So it's clear that our evidence is very partial. And indeed, most of our evidence is restricted to the reigns of Antiochus III and Antiochus IV, with a little bit for, you know, like Seleucus I and his son at the beginning of the dynasty. So we do have to be aware of the potential for changes over time that we're just not aware of. And we should, you know, avoid the assumption that everything remains the same, that what we see in our sources is the same all the way through for the period. So that's one thing that we need to be aware of when we talk about the Seleucid army. 
Another thing is that out of those three instances, there are complications with them. So Polybius's account of the parade at Daphne is crucially not an account of an actual battle. It's a military procession, so there's lots of emphasis on grandeur and prestige. You have lots of units that have, you know, flashy armour like gold shields. So we're not entirely sure that every unit that is described in this parade is actually a military unit. There's a lot of debate about that in the scholarship. So we're not sure how far this parade is an accurate reflection of Seleucid military realities. So we do have to treat it with care. You know, it's still a very important source, but we do have to be careful with it. Additionally, further complications arise with Polybius' account of Raphia. So this is a really wonderful account. It gives us lots of information of the Ptolemaic army and the Seleucid army. And we get lots of detailed information about the infantry units. But then when Polybius comes to tell you about the cavalry, he just says, oh, and there were 6,000 cavalry. He just calls them, you know, the cavalry, tone hippion in Greek, without any further details. And that's, that's really frustrating. And that tendency to treat the cavalry as this sort of collective is frustratingly common. So when you're trying to work out who was actually in the cavalry and who was in what battle, it can get a little complicated. So our literary sources are very, very important to us. Of course they are. And they're the reason we know things about particular battles, but they're not without their problems. That said, though, we can supplement them with other types of evidence. There is iconographic evidence, numismatic evidence, you know, inscriptions, papyri, archaeological material. And that other type of evidence can be valuable for giving us a view into issues that the literary sources are not as concerned about. So our literary sources are written by elite Greek men, or sometimes elite Roman men, for their peers. And we have to remember the Seleucid Empire is a vast empire, and Greek isn't the only language spoke there. So when we deal with stuff like the cuneiform evidence, that can be very useful for giving us a non-Greek view of the empire. And that's important to remember for an empire that's as big and as vast as the Seleucids. When we deal with this type of evidence, stuff like the Babylonian astronomical diaries are very useful. They tell us things like the arrival of 20 elephants in Babylon that have come from Bactria in 275 BC. Or they tell us about a battle between Demetrius and Alexander Ballas in 150 BC. And if we didn't have this evidence, we just wouldn't know about it at all. So it is very, very useful. As I said, there are other inscriptions that can tell us, you know, things about how various cities relate to each other or relate to the king. There's nice iconographical pictures of horses, say, on the Apadana frieze at Persepolis. There's obviously archaeological finds. I think there's some cataphract armour that was found at Icarnum. And of course, there's a wide range of coinage. So that can be very useful for showing us how horses and elephants, for example, are important for Seleucid royal propaganda. So there is a quite a wide range of things that we can use, but it very much depends on the questions that you want to answer as to what sources are available to you and how useful those sources are going to be. With regards to, you know, understanding the Seleucid army, particularly its mounted units, it's still very much the case that some issues are going to remain open to, you know, speculation and interpretation. When people think of the use of cavalry in battle, they often think of large war stallions and daring charges into the front ranks of the enemy army, a la the Charge of the Light Brigade, or perhaps even Alexander Agaugamela in Issus. But in the context of ancient warfare, how did cavalry function on the battlefield? Were there any major differences, whether in terms of technology, animal husbandry, or attitudes, that distinguishes ancient cavalry from later practices? Right, so when we talk about the Seleucid cavalry, it's important to note first that they are the heirs to two separate cavalry traditions. The first being the Greco Macedonian tradition of Alexander the Great, and then the second being the Achaemenid Persians. And both were important and successful cavalry traditions, so we should expect to see some kind of blending of this in the Seleucid army. Now, cavalry are a very interesting and flexible arm on the battlefield. You know, as such, they're usually positioned on the flanks of an army because, you know, they need more space to operate. And once you've got this development of heavy armed phalanx based infantry, this infantry is very good at frontal attacks, but it's a lot more vulnerable in its unprotected flanks and its rear, and it isn't very good at turning round very quickly. It's natural to put your cavalry on those flanks to protect your infantry and give the cavalry the space that they need to manoeuvre. And therefore it's quite typical to see, you know, a commander try to defeat the opposing cavalry so that he can then outflank the infantry on its unprotected sides. And it's important to note that in the ancient world at least, it's very, very unlikely that you are going to directly charge into the front of 
the heavy infantry with your cavalry. You might do it against light infantry, but against heavy armed infantry, it's very, very unlikely you're going to do that. And that's for the simple reason that, you know, horses aren't stupid. They do not want to charge a wall of spears. Now, Sears and Willux have recently argued that the Macedonians were able to do this at Chironea in 338 BC through the, you know, the adoption of the Scythian wedge formation and, you know, the exploitation of the horse's herding instincts. That is still really debated in the scholarship, so no one's really sure for definite whether that did happen at Chironea. And I would point out that even if, you know, you theoretically can do it, it's not without great detriment to your cavalry. You are not going to come out unscathed from doing that. It's not really a good idea. It's better to, you know, do something else. Once we move into the Hellenistic period, where you've got Sarissa bearing phalanxes, so with really long pikes, you absolutely cannot charge that head on because the Sarissa allows up to four ranks to present their pikes at the front. And that means even if you can convince your horse to charge it, you're going to end up skewered long before you get anywhere close to actually attacking the infantry. So you're just not going to do it. So what it tends to be preferred instead is that you try to open up a gap in that infantry line and then you can charge the gap without getting your horses skewered by the pikes. And this is Alexander's typical practice. He likes to do this a lot, you know, pin down the infantry, open up a gap, and then charge that gap with your cavalry. Alternatively, if you don't want to do that or you can't open the gap, you'll try to, you know, outflank the enemy infantry on its unprotected sides. Now, we know the Macedonian cavalry under Alexander the Great is extremely successful. When we move to the Hellenistic period, however, there's a tendency in the modern scholarship to claim, oh, you know, Hellenistic cavalry decline in importance and operational efficacy in comparison. They're not being as decisive as they were under Alexander. They tend to neutralize each other and the battle is decided by the infantry instead. Now, such arguments, I find, misunderstand the realities of the Hellenistic period. And I get a little bit irritated by them, so it, it is something I argue against. It's what my PhD research was arguing against. Because it's important to remember that Alexander's battlefield conditions are not the same as those faced by the Hellenistic commanders. His opponents are not the same as the Hellenistic commanders. The Hellenistic period is a period of limited asymmetry in warfare. So what that means is both armies tend to have the same kinds of troops with the same tactical mindsets. So it's not that cavalry of this period has got any worse. You know, they can still do what Alexander's cavalry could do. It's just the nature of battle has changed. So with that in mind, when we look at the Seleucids, we can actually see, you know, quite a great deal of variation and experimentation in the way that they deploy and use their cavalry. Of course, we're limited in our information for the Seleucid cavalry. We only have a handful of battles that we actually know things about. The cavalry are used in many different battles, but there's only a few where we're actually told what they're doing. So these battles are Ipsus in 301 BC the battle against Molon in 220 BC, which is a very interesting battle because it pits two Seleucid armies against each other. There's also Raphia, as I've mentioned, Taporia in around 208, Panion in 200 BC, Thermopylae in 191, Magnesia in 190, Beth Zechariah in 162, and Alassa in 160. As I said, there are definitely other battles outside of that where we, even that we know that there were cavalry, but those are the battles that we actually know what the cavalry were doing or where they were placed. So in those battles, we see a variety of different battle positions. As I said, the flank is the most common position to put your cavalry and the Seleucids place their cavalry here in practically every battle that we know about. That doesn't necessarily mean it's always done for the same tactical purpose. There can be different reasons as to why you've done that and why you've put your cavalry there. So at Raphia, on the right wing, Polybius tells us that there are 2000 cavalry and then there are another 2,000 cavalry who are positioned at an angle to them. So these are in oblique formation with a refused flank. And we're not entirely sure whether that angle is pointing forwards or backwards, but it's quite clear that this has been done to increase the offensive capacity of this wing so that it can really make a decisive attack against the opposing Ptolemaic cavalry. And also by refusing the flank, you increase the defensive capabilities of that wing because it makes it much harder for the enemy to outflank you. And that sort of idea mirrors what Alexander does at Galgamela. If you want to position your cavalry elsewhere, though, you don't want to put them on the flank, you could put them in the centre. It's a little more unusual, but we do see the Seleucids do it. The most famous example of this is Magnesia. So on the left-hand side of the Seleucid army at Magnesia, the cavalry are on the flank. It's totally normal. On the right-hand side, though, that's where things get a little bit more weird. We have the heavy infantry phalanx in the centre. Then we're told that 
There is the Agamer and the Cataphracts of the cavalry, so very heavy armoured cavalry. And so far, you know, that seems quite normal. But then we're told that on the other side of the cavalry is the Argoraspides, who are another very heavy infantry unit. They form the heavy infantry of the Royal Guard. So this is really, really odd because you've got a heavy cavalry in the middle of two heavy infantry units and we don't see this anywhere else. So that's very, very odd. And we think it might have been done that this cavalry is acting as a hinge between these two units to allow for them to punch through the opposing Roman line and then outflank them. That isn't what happens as the whole battle is a mess, but that's what we think is going on there. The Slicids also have cavalry in the centre at Panion. This is in 200 BC. Now, trying to understand what is going on at the Battle of Panion is very complicated because Polybius's account, which is only two chapters of Book 16, he spends his entire account complaining that the earlier historian Zeno, his account doesn't make any sense. So trying to work out what is going on in this battle is a little complex. But even so, he tells us there's some lighter cavalry with the elephants in the centre, so we think they're acting as some kind of support for the elephants. And he also tells us that the companions are positioned with the king in the centre of the battlefield. And that, again, is quite odd because the king is usually on the right wing of the battle. But as I said, you know, this battle is a little confusing. And then we also see the Seleucids sometimes keep their cavalry in reserve. Now, this might be done like at Thermopylae because... The terrain is just not very good for cavalry, so we just keep them out of the way. And in the battle against Molon, though, we do hear of an offensive reserve. Antiochus III keeps some of his cavalry at the back, and along with the infantry, and he gives them orders to say, once the battle has started, you are to circle round and outflank the enemy. And that is really interesting. You know, this is a really interesting way of using your cavalry. So, as I said, there are lots of different positions that the Seleucid cavalry can be in on the battlefield. As for its actual tactical manoeuvres, the most common, obviously, is a charge and pursuit, you know, where you charge your enemy, you rout your enemy, and then you pursue them off the battlefield. And sometimes, you know, this can be very, very successful, like at Deporia. We also see it successfully done at Panion, where the cavalry attack the opposing cavalry, defeat them, and then wheel into the exposed phalanx, which is what you should do. We do, however, see it go very, very wrong. So Raphia and Magnesia, we see Antiochus III, he charges his opponents, he's successful, he routes them, and then he blindly charges after them off the battlefield and just sort of ignores the rest of the battle. And by the time he remembers, he's already lost the battle. So it goes very, very wrong. And you would think he would have learned his lesson from Raphia, particularly when he's seen it done properly at Panion, it's the son who does it well at Panion. You'd think by Magnesia he would have learnt his lesson, but he didn't. Alternatively, from this charge and pursuit idea, you can do the opposite, which is a sham retreat. So instead of charging your opponent, what you're going to do is pretend to fall back and lure them away either from the battlefield or into a trap. And we see this done very, very successfully at Ipsus, where the Seleucid cavalry fall back from Demetrius's attack. They lure Demetrius away from the battlefield. Seleucus can then move his elephants across the pass to block Demetrius' return, and that exposes the Antigonid phalanx for him to attack. We also see it at the much later battle of Elassa in 160 BC, where Bacchides, again, he falls back, he lures Judas Maccabeus away and lures him into a trap and then kills him. And then finally, of course, there is the more standard harassment of the enemy using your missile cavalry, so your javelin men, your archers. Again, we see this done very successfully at Ipsus, where Seleucus harasses the Antigonid phalanx, so much so that he convinces a lot of them to surrender. So that shows that even though this is a very standard way of fighting, you know, it's not very innovative. You know, we've seen this all the time with cavalry. It can still be very, very successful if you use it in the right conditions. Now, of course, there are times when the Seleucids have that used against them. So Eumenes uses it against them at Magnesia with the chariots. And there are also times when it just doesn't work. We know at the Battle of Azotos, the Seleucids try to do this sort of harassment technique. It doesn't work. And all the cavalry do is tire themselves out. But on the whole, I think we can see, you know, the Seleucid cavalry are very, very important. They remain very important. It's not to say that they win everything, that they're decisive all the time. We do know that it's the infantry, for example, that saved the day at Deporia. We also know there are places like Thermopylae or other battles like the storming of the Porphyrian Pass where, you know, the terrain isn't suitable for cavalry. But 
despite that, we can see the cavalry are a very important element of the Seleucid army, and we should remember that. Generally speaking, service as a cavalryman was reserved for the wealthier elite, given the expenses of owning and outfitting a horse. In the case of Ptolemaic Egypt, horsemen who were integrated into the clerici system were given more substantial land holdings and were of a higher class than their infantry counterparts. Can you speak about the socio-economic backgrounds of these riders within the Seleucid realm? How were they called for service? And how were they compensated? Okay, so this is a question with several layers to the answer. So, of course, you know, owning a horse takes quite a bit of money, so it does tend to be the wealthier end of society that typically comprise a cavalry's forces. This is especially so once we get to the heavier cavalry that need lots of armour and bulky horses. That is, of course, you know, assuming that it's the individual who has to, you know, pay for that equipment and pay for that horse, rather than the state who provide it. But those kind of questions are very complicated with ancient armies and often are very debated. For the Seleucids, it's necessary to answer this question to outline the different types of cavalrymen that they have in their army. So, first of all, the two mounted contingents that we know the most about are the Companions and the Agema, who form the Seleucid Royal Guard, you know, along with the Argoraspides of the infantry, which I mentioned. And these are stationed at the War Office in Apamea and were on permanent military duty. They're part of the Guard, their job is to protect the King's interests. Now, whether the king provides horses for these soldiers because, you know, they're his guard, or whether they're expected to buy them from the war office is a little more uncertain. But Strabo, in his geography, he does tell us that the Seleucids did keep a royal horse stud at Apamea, along with cult breakers and instructors who can teach heavy armed fighting. So it's possible, you know, that there's some level of state concern there, even if we don't know how extensive it was. Following the guard are often described by modern scholars as regulars. So those men who form the core of the army, the people who the king is not going to go to war without. The term regular isn't perhaps the best term, but it is the term we see the most in the scholarship. There's been quite a bit of debate in the scholarship as to whether a military settlement system similar to the Ptolemy's clerici system existed in the Seleucid Empire. So, i.e., you know, a system where settlers are given land in return for hereditary obligations of military service. As I said, that's been very debated whether it exists in the Seleucid Empire. I would argue that if you look very carefully at the evidence, and some of that evidence is complicated, but if you look carefully at it, I would say there is evidence for this system. Even, you know, if it's not entirely clear if the hereditary obligation is tied to the land itself or just the individual settler. These soldiers would not have been on permanent military duty during peacetime, but the king would have been able to count on them, you know, when he goes to war. Whether the Seleucid cavalry settlers are expected to provide their own horse as part of their obligation is, again, you know, uncertain, but we do know, at least theoretically, that a cavalryman's plot of land would have been larger than an infantryman's, because the inscription OGIS 229 refers to a cavalryman's lot, a Clairon Hippocon. So there's some parallels with Ptolemaic practice here, and we know from other ancient armies that when it comes to pay, cavalrymen are typically paid more than infantrymen, if only, you know, because they've got to look after their horse as well. Those are the first two types of cavalry, and then there are also those troops which do not have any formal military obligations to the king during times of peace. You know, those that the king only calls up when he goes to war as part of general mobilization. So these are going to be, you know, your regular subjects, your allies, your mercenaries, the people you don't need in your army unless you're going to war. For these troops, I think it's much more likely that it's the individual who is expected to provide his own horse and equipment. And indeed, it may very well have been that the simple fact of owning a horse is what makes you eligible for this kind of military service. Possessing the largest geographical spread of the Hellenistic successor kingdoms, the Seleucids were exposed to the cavalry traditions of the Near East, the Iranian Plateau, and the Steppe, in addition to the practices of their Macedonian homeland. In the face of this sheer variety, to what extent did the Seleucids try to adopt and incorporate those practices, whether it was Macedonian-style companion cavalrymen or horse archers from Sogdia? So, this is a question that links, you know, nicely to the previous one. As you know, you know, the Seleucid Empire is this vast place. It encompasses many different peoples and cultures, and as I noted earlier, it's significantly the heirs to two dominant cavalry traditions. And this meeting and merging of cultures is what makes the Seleucid Empire this fascinating region to study. It's also, you know, an empire that has some of the best horses of the ancient world and access to some of the best horse raising grounds of the ancient world. Now, 
The most obviously Macedonian style contingents in the Seleucid cavalry are the Companions and the Agema of the Guard, because these are units that have evolved directly from Alexander the Great's army. Now in Alexander the Great's army, the Agema is an elite subunit of the Companions, whereas in the Seleucid army these are two separate units, though even here the Agema is still, you know, the more prestigious of the two. And in the Seleucid army, these units are a thousand strong each, and they form then the two thousand strong Seleucid cavalry guard. As for the ethnicity of the men within these units, this is a more complex question. Some scholars, such as Bar Kochva, you know, have suggested that there's this ethnic split between the two units of the guard, that the companions are predominantly Greco Macedonian or, you know, Greco Macedonian descendants, and that the Agema is made up of more Eastern soldiers. And this is supported by some of our sources, so Livy in his account of the Seleucid army at Magnesia in 190 BC agrees with this sort of split, but it's still a rather complicated issue and there are other ancient authors such as Appian and Diodorus that don't quite agree with this and show it might not quite have been that simple. I'm tentatively willing to accept that there is this division, that there's a more Eastern flavour to the Gamer and a slightly more typical Greco Macedonian flavour to the Companions, but I would say we shouldn't push that too far. It's best to allow for some fluidity in the ethnicity of the unit's members. You know, things in reality very rarely fit into nice little boxes. When we move to the regulars, again, that issue of ethnicity is a more complicated one, and I do think we should resist this idea that they're exclusively Greco Macedonian. You know, even if that is predominantly the case to start with, I think, again, it's likely to have been a bit more fluid. It is likely, though, that these troops, the regulars, did fight in a typically Macedonian style, at least to start with, until, you know, we get the development of the heavier cataphracts later in the 3rd century BC, during, you know, Antiochus III's reign, following his campaigns in Parthia. Beyond this, however, we can still see a wide range of different cultures and fighting styles in the Seleucid cavalry, especially in its less regular cavalry units. We can see units such as the Dahai, these are a nomadic people from the region of the Caspian Sea, so Strabo in his geography identifies these people as Scythian, and these people specialise in light missile cavalry. We also hear of Galatian cavalry in the Seleucid army at Magnesia, we also hear of Tarentine cavalry, I've mentioned them before. The Tarentines are actually quite an interesting cavalry unit because they're not limited solely to the Seleucids, you know, we see them in lots of different Hellenistic armies. It's believed that the Tarentines started as mercenary cavalry from Tarentum in Italy, but given their widespread use, it's believed the name Tarentine quickly evolves into the pseudo-ethnic title that only implies their fighting style, because they have a very distinctive fighting style. As Arian and Aelianus Tacticus tell us, the Tarentines are armed with a pair of javelins, and they specialise in rapid skirmishing from a distance before closing in for close combat. So. That ability to be able to wield two spears, you know, one for throwing, one for engaging in close range fighting, that is going to require the rider to be able to move his second spear from one hand to another whilst he's charging. That, you know, implies a high degree of training. You know, you really do have to practice that before you can even pull it off on the battlefield. And then, of course, it's very likely that there's going to be lots of different other types of cavalry that we just don't have evidence for. As I said, you know, our evidence is very partial. And if we compare the evidence for, say, the Achaemenid Persian cavalry, we hear about all sorts of different types of cavalry armed with all manner of weapons. And to be honest, there's no reason why the Seleucids could not have made use of this when they could and when it's appropriate. So there's a fairly large and diverse range of cultures and fighting styles within the Seleucid cavalry. And as I said, it's one of the things which makes this empire and this style of warfare so fascinating to study. One of the most iconic and flashier elements of Hellenistic warfare, and perhaps of ancient warfare in general, is the use of war elephants. The Seleucids seem to be particularly associated with their deployment. Demetrius Polyarchides, for instance, once mockingly bestowed the title Elephant King on Seleucus I. How did elephants play a role in warfare in the context of the Seleucid Empire? What were the logistical challenges faced in acquiring and maintaining a steady supply of the world's largest land animal? First off, it is worth noting that it's one of Demetrius' followers, and he actually calls Seleucus I Elephant Archies, which translates to Master of Elephants, rather than Elephant King. But that's done so as to mockingly reduce Seleucus to the status of a servant. He's one who, he only looks after the elephants, in comparison to Demetrius, you know, who is the only true king. And we get similar jests about the other Diadochi 
the other successors as well. So I think Ptolemy is called the Admiral of the Navy. You know, he's not a king. He's just, you know, some servant we have. But even so, that jest is very, very important because it tells us that although elephants are incredibly important for all Hellenistic armies at this period, you know, they're used by all the major powers, it is the Seleucid army that is the most well known for them. And that's why Seleucus is singled out as the master of elephants. I mean, yes, of course, you know, we get the Carthaginians later and they're very famous for their use. But even so, even then, it is still the Seleucids that have the largest number of war elephants in this period outside of India. So, you know, it's clear that war elephants were a very significant feature of the Seleucid army. And part of my thesis was interested in investigating how these animals are integrated into the Seleucid mounted corps. War elephants can be used in a variety of ways on the battlefield, depending on what you want them to do. And it is the Seleucids that are the most creative with the war elephants out of all of the Hellenistic powers. Obviously, they're not as innovative as ancient Indian armies, but we do see quite a bit of variation and flexibility in the Seleucid army. The most common position for war elephants on the battlefield is to position them across the front of your army. So either across the entire line or just part of it. And this is the position we see most commonly across the Hellenistic period. And to be honest, it's immediately clear why you would want to do that, because it effortlessly capitalises on the elephant's awe-inspiring appearance. You know, these are really impressive looking animals and putting them at the front really highlights that. And one of the most important uses of elephants on the battlefield is as a psychological weapon. Now, obviously that's not their only use, but it is a very important element in their introduction and their continued participation in ancient warfare. And you, we, you know, we have many, many accounts of men and horses. Don't forget, elephants can also scare horses who are unfamiliar with them. So we have many accounts of an army getting frightened and fleeing from an enemy's elephants. And this is perhaps most spectacularly seen in the so-called elephant victory in the late 270s BC, when the 16 Seleucid elephants under Antiochus I allegedly terrify the Galatians so much that they just turn and run away before anyone is even within bowshot. Another advantage of placing your elephant across the front is, you know, you can also neutralise an opponent's elephants. And this is something that we see if both sides have elephants, they always place them well, or nearly always place them opposite each other so that they can combat each other. The only exception to this tends to be when one side has Indian elephants and one side has Asian elephants. And our most famous account of elephants engaging each other is Polybius' account of Raphia in 217 BC. You've got the Seleucid Asian elephants attacking the Ptolemy's African elephants. Of course, you know, there are other places you could position your elephants, and it is here then that we see the Seleucids deviate from other Hellenistic powers. The Seleucids are more open to these other placements. So you could position the elephants within your main line. You integrate them into the main battle line. They're not a separate feature. And this is what we see at Magnesia in 190 BC, where the elephants are integrated into the phalanx. So you have a little bit of the phalanx, then some elephants, then a bit more of the phalanx, then some more elephants. You could also position your elephants behind your main line. So this could either be, you know, as a second line of defense or just to keep them out of the way, depending on, you know, what you want them to do and the circumstances of the battle. So that's how you could, you know, position them. When you're using them beyond the psychological effect, which as I've mentioned, you know, is very, very important. Elephants are also very useful for blocking other units, you know, because they're big, they're bulky. Trying to get past them, it, you know, isn't very easy. And this is most spectacularly seen at Ipsus in 301 BC, as I've alluded to already. So following the Seleucids' sham retreat, which lures Demetrius' cavalry away from the battle, Seleucus moves a large number of his elephants across that pass. It blocks Demetrius' return. He can't get past those elephants. And that means, you know, that the Antigonid phalanx is now cavalryless. It doesn't have that protection and Seleucus can attack it as he wishes. And that shows us a wonderful example of combined armed warfare where each individual arm is working together to create this really decisive effect. I'm very keen to stress this sort of thing, the elephants and indeed the other unconventional weapons of the Seleucid army, they're intended to work alongside the cavalry and alongside the other units to make this effect. Of course, you know, elephants aren't without their problems. They can easily panic, they can trample your own troops if they get out of control, and there are many, many battles that we hear about where that is the case. The battle is lost because the elephants panicked, they got out of control, they trampled everybody. 
But we do have to remember, you know, that they are animals. They're not machines. We do have to make allowances for that. And then, of course, on top, as you mentioned, there is the logistical costs of maintaining them. And this is considerable. For the Seleucids, you know, you have to transport them from India all the way to Apamea in Syria. So that's a long way to get them. Strabo tells us that it's at Apamea where they're kept. They also need lots of food and water. They leave a lot of waste, you know, so the elephants are very expensive animals and that is important to remember when we talk about them. Now, I would say that that's balanced, I think, by their benefits, so long as, you know, you can still get access to them. But once, you know, you lose that access, so when Parthia invades Media in about the 140s BC and cuts off the Seleucid's access, I would say it's, that's the reason we start to see elephants not being used in the Hellenistic period, just because you can't get to them and it then costs far, far too much. And, you know, we do see elephants being revived later under the Sassanids. And of course, you know, elephants continue to be used in India and Southeast Asia for centuries. In a similar vein to elephants, the Seleucids are well known for their adoption of the cataphract, mounted warriors equipped in heavy armor who have been sometimes likened to being a prototype for knights of medieval Europe. What can you tell us about the cataphracts? both in regards to their origin and function, and what, if any, influences they had on the wider Mediterranean. Yes, so the cataphracts are something which, as I mentioned, we see from the late 3rd century BC onward. They're introduced by Antiochus III following his campaigns in Parthia, where he apparently sees the Parthians using cataphracts or something similar, and he decides he likes them, he's impressed with these, and he adopts this idea for himself and develops it within the Seleucid army. A cataphract is a very heavily armoured cavalryman. That means that both the rider and the horse are in full armour. So you need very bulky horses to be able to carry all this weight. They don't have to be really tall horses, but they do have to be quite bulky, which is going to add to the expense because you need, you know, very high quality horses for this. In the ancient world, this is going to be huge Nisaean horses, which originated from Media in southwestern Iran. Thankfully for the Seleucids, they can have this kind of cavalry because they have access to these really good horses. There's some debate as to whether, you know, this the full armour is plate armour or scale armour, which is a little more flexible. And we do have some depictions of and representations of cataphracts. So there's a relief on the Temple of Athena Nekephoros in Pergamum, and there's also the archaeological finds from Icarnum, and I think there's also a Syrian figurine, which I believe is now in the Louvre. But as a consequence of this heavy armour, you're going to have to adjust how you sit on the horse. You can't just sit on the horse as you normally do. The armour is going to change how you sit. So it's clear, you know, that the cataphracts have to have some training beforehand to learn to sit again on the horse in all that armour. We have to remember there's no stirrups in the ancient world. You do have to make sure you can stay on your horse. You're also going to need to practice because you need to be able to act together with your fellow cataphracts so that you can all charge together and move together because otherwise that is going to be a disaster on the battlefield. And we see that the Seleucid cataphracts are capable of performing quite complex battle manoeuvres. In their first recorded appearance at the Battle of Panion in 200 BC, we can see that despite the complications of Polybius's account here, we see the Seleucid cataphracts, they charge the opposing Ptolemaic cavalry, and then, as I've mentioned, they wheel round into the exposed flank of the Ptolemaic phalanx in what, you know, is a very impressive, very incredibly successful attack on the Ptolemaic army. It's clear there must have been some kind of training, even if, you know, our sources aren't interested in telling us that, we don't know very much about it. And the cataphracts are very, very successful for the Seleucids. We see them all the time once they're introduced. They do have a few problems at Magnesia on the left-hand side of the battle, but that's not really their fault. That is the chariot's fault, which caused this whole left wing to very quickly collapse. Despite that, the cataphract is incredibly successful, and it is something that is incredibly long-lived. The Parthians and the Sassanids use this type of cavalry. The Romans are aware of the cataphract cavalry. So they have a very long lasting influence on mounted warfare. And it's one of the things I always will point to when people say, oh, you know, Hellenistic cavalry, they're not that good, are they? But the cataphract, the cataphract was very, very useful, very, very successful. Many of the more exotic troops employed by the Seleucids, for lack of a better term, and by extension, the other Hellenistic powers often get a bad rap for their apparently lackluster performance on the battlefield. I'm mainly thinking of the ineffectual role of elephants and scythe chariots during Antiochus III's war against the Roman Republic. 
In your estimation, do you think that this is a reputation that is well-deserved, or do you think that there is more to the use of such unit variety outside of a strictly tactical perspective? This is a major part of my work on unconventional units, and a part of my PhD thesis was devoted to illustrating the tactical value of unconventional troops in the Seleucid Mounted Corps. I would note we probably should avoid using the term exotic when we talk about these troops because it can evoke Eurocentric or Westercentric perspectives that aren't technically appropriate for the Seleucid Empire and Eastern powers. But So as you know, it's common amongst a lot of modern scholarship to claim that the unconventional units that were introduced in the Hellenistic warfare were not that great. So in particular, scholars such as Ducre and Serate, amongst others, have argued that there's a decline in the quality and the abilities of Hellenistic cavalry, and that the reason for this is the introduction of units such as the war elephants. And indeed, you, you get lots of scholars, they frequently characterise this period's fascination with unusual weapons as a hindrance, they dismiss them as one-off novelties, that their effects quickly wear off. That's particularly so with the elephants. They say, oh, well, yeah, of course, they're great when you first have them. No one's seen them before, so they're big and scary. But once you get used to them, then they just start to become a hindrance, you know, they're not very reliable. Now, I completely disagree with this attitude. Not only would I argue that there is absolutely no evidence for this decline in the cavalry of this period, but importantly, this dismissive attitude towards units like the war elephant has created crucial misunderstandings of their use in Hellenistic warfare. And I would just like to point out that even if you're familiar with elephants, it's still going to be really terrifying to have them charge towards you in battle. So we know that cavalry alone can be terrifying even for veteran soldiers. And here you can think, well, the horse at least is going to try not to stand on you. And that isn't the case, you know, when you deal with elephants. They can pick you up in their trunks, they can trample you, and they're just so much bigger. So we really should not discount that psychological dimension, even amongst those soldiers who are familiar with them. One thing that is important to remember when we discuss the Hellenistic period is that, you know, as I mentioned before, until the Romans arrive on the scene, there is very little asymmetry in warfare. Both armies are virtually the same, they have the same types of troops, the same tactical mindsets, and this means that no one side has any real decisive advantage over their opponents. Battles tend to become more walls of attrition. And that's why we don't see anything like Alexander's meteoric success in the Hellenistic period. It's not that Hellenistic commanders, they're no good, it's not that at all. It's simply that the nature of warfare has changed. So given the symmetry of Hellenistic armies, you then find scholars saying, well, it's quite reasonable, you know, to assume that this period's fascination with unusual contingents is this attempt to regain this advantage over your opponents, this sort of arms race to discover this new superweapon. However, I would argue that rather than viewing these troops as purely one-off innovations, it is necessary to explain their sustained use. I mean, war elephants especially were a constant feature on the battlefield for over 150 years. They're used by every major army of this period, so they're used by the Greeks, they're used by the Macedonians, they're used by the Seleucids, the Ptolemies, the Carthaginians, and even the Romans. And that's worth pointing out because a lot of scholarship will tell you that the Romans didn't think that war elephants were very good and that they didn't really use them. But that's really not the case. The Romans did use elephants and they did sometimes use them very, very successfully. As we can see, for example, at the Battle of Pydna in 168 BC. This continued use, this long period where they are used, makes it clear that they are a valued and important part of the warfare of this period and we do need to pay attention to that. I would say that there are two main interconnected reasons why that is the case. The first is the tactical considerations. I personally refuse to accept the implication of a lot of the scholarship that Hellenistic commanders are also tactically inept, that they keep using a weapon that everybody knows is useless. As I said, that was part of my PhD research to investigate how they're integrated into the tactical conception of the army. And, you know, I would propose that war elephant scythe chariots, camel archers, are meant to work alongside the other units to help make a decisive effect on the battlefield. And as I've alluded to, we can see that at Ipsus. There are also hints of it at Raphia and at Panion, and even potentially at Magnesia. That's not to say that this attempt is always successful, so we know from Magnesia that the scythe chariots were spectacularly awful. And I have to admit, to be honest, I am a lot more critical about the scythe chariots because Okay, they can be successful, but they're usually just a mess, so I don't think that they're very good. 
But even so, even here at Magnesia, I would argue that it's still clear, you know, that they are still an important element in the Seleucid battle line. They're right at the front of the army. If you didn't want to use them, if you didn't think they were any good, you wouldn't put them at the front of your army. So I'd argue that then what they're meant to do is open the battle and create a gap in the opposing line, and then the cavalry who are stationed behind them can charge that gap. Okay, that is not what happens. It goes very wrong very quickly. The chariots are the reason the entire Seleucid left wing collapses, and Livy especially is very, very critical of them. That said, though, it's clear from Appian's alternative narrative of the battle that Eumenes, who's stationed on that opposite Roman wing, he does take the chariots very seriously. Appian tells us Eumenes isn't that bothered about the other units opposite him, but he is concerned about the chariots and he decides that he needs to deal with them immediately. And then he attacks them at the beginning of the battle. And it's clear that even with the units that had limited success, there's still a tactical reason for them, even if, you know, in reality it doesn't transpire as the commander hoped. The second reason, I think, for the introduction and continued use of these units is to do with the dynamics of prestige and, you know, and power projection. And again, this is something that is very relevant for the war elephants especially. So, you know, the Hellenistic world is this period of intense cultural interaction. The image and presentation of the Hellenistic monarchs is very, very important. It's this delicate balancing act. And especially in the chaos following Alexander the Great's death, when you've got a lot of competition, you need to show that you are the king, that you're the one people should be following and you're, you are much better than your followers. So you're forever going to be looking for ways to emphasise your grandeur, you know, illustrate this power that you have and continue to show that you are a successful military figure. You are to be respected. So with that in mind, when we think about the elephant and its capacity as the psychological weapon and its magnificent appearance, I mean, even today, you know, everyone thinks, you know, elephants are very inspiring animals. When you've got the king at the top of the socio-political pyramid, it's unsurprising that they then choose the biggest land animal to be associated with imperial power. It embodies all of those characteristics that you as a king want to show off. And okay, as well, you've got the great expense of elephants. You having elephants as a king allows you to show off in this ostentatious display of your wealth and your power that, look, I can get these, ex these animals from faraway lands and they're big and they cost a lot of money. And even in regions where the elephant is naturally in abundance, so places like India, like Southeast Asia, the number of elephants a king possessed was a direct indication of his prestige. It's unsurprising that we start to see this in the Hellenistic world as well. And following the success at the Battle of Ipsus, elephants very quickly become emblematic of the Seleucid Empire. And that ties into what we mentioned before with the title Elephantarchy's Master of Elephants. The Seleucids, you know, are known for their elephants. And we see pictures of Athena Nike. So the victorious Athena in a chariot pulled by elephants on Seleucid coins. And we see that idea being replicated elsewhere. So the Ptolemies have coins with Alexander in an elephant chariot. We get Roman coins with this sort of imagery as well. We get other elephant imagery on coins across the Hellenistic period. So you see different rulers wearing an elephant scalp as this decorative headdress on their coins in a similar manner to, you know, Heracles wearing his famous lion skin. Yeah, I'd definitely argue that Although, you know, unconventional weapons are not without their problems and their shortcomings, and I think it is important to note, no troop on the battlefield is perfect. Every type of armament, every type of contingent is going to have some problems. So despite those potential problems, these unconventional units are very important, both socio-politically and tactically. So no, I really don't think they deserve the bad rep that they get a lot of the time. I might make an exception for chariots. I'm not very impressed by them, but on the whole, I don't think they deserve the bad rep they get. I think it's important that we remember they were continually used. They were taken very seriously by their opponents. So the Romans are very insistent that the Carthaginians and the Seleucids, when they've been defeated, they're not allowed any more elephants in their army. Now, the Seleucids don't pay any attention to that, but I think the fact that it's in the peace treaty, it's in those peace terms, is very significant. You know, the Romans take this seriously. It's clear that because the ancient world took them seriously, we should do the same. We should consider them as serious weapons of war. It's, it's our job to understand why they were used and how they were integrated into the theoretical and tactical conceptions of the armies that used them. And that's something, you know, that I'm particularly interested in with my research. It is something, you know, I think we should spend a lot more time thinking about.
On that note, I think this is a great place to bring our discussion to a close. And once again, I really appreciate you for joining us today to talk about the Seleucids, which is always a favorite topic of mine. But if any listeners wanted to follow your work, is there anything you would wish to plug? Social media, any upcoming projects, that sort of thing? So I'm relatively active on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at winged bookworm on twitter so you can follow me there and i post sometimes you know what i'm doing and the different if i've been on any other podcasts or any other videos i also have an academia page so if you look for me there i occasionally post things there and you know i'm always open if you want to send me a message on either of those i'm quite happy to discuss with people any things that they're interested in I'll be including links to Dr. Gerard's Twitter account and her academia page in the podcast description and episode notes if you want to see some of her work and publications. But until next time, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>